This is my first. This is my first talk in Wales since 1992. I was at a small conference in Swansea in 92 in February. And, and that's it. That's the only other time I've been to Wales. So this is really exciting, <laughs> I suppose, in a way. Um, I hope to, to come again in a more corporeal fashion. So um, I'm going to be talking about my work with Kai Berend on Banakli, higher Banakli groupoids. Um, so I've been doing this project over the last several years. Uh, actually, this is a part of a, of a larger project on derived uh, groupoids. So we are very interested in this modern approach to the theory of moduli spaces, where you put in derived geometry, which is a sort of non-linear uh, non analog of the idea of uh, projective resolution of modules. And I'm not going to touch on that today, but I can give you the message that many of the techniques that I'm introducing here are sufficiently general to carry over to that um, much more refined setting. Um, but this will be, uh, this is closer in many ways, I think, to the interests of most of the people here. So, so I'm going to construct examples of, of what I call higher Banakli groupoids. And, and one of the main results is that you can use a, uh, a technique from homotopy theory that was developed actually for algebraic K-theory purposes uh, called the uh, theory of categories of fibrant objects. So categories of fibrant objects somehow express the essence of uh, homotopy theory. And it turns out that uh, lots of the things that those of you who work with Lie groupoids know find very natural expression in the language of categories of fibrant objects. So they then are a very natural way to generalize that to the theory of higher groupoids. So when k is zero, I'm just going to get back the theory of Banach analytic varieties of Duadi. And when k is one, we're going to get the theory of analytic Banachli groupoids, um, except that the space of objects won't be necessarily a manifold like it was in Erisman's work, but it'll be a analytic variety. But uh, if you think about it, that's hardly much of a change. Uh, if you simply then uh, impose the extra condition in your theorems, let, let G be a analytic Banakli groupoid such that the space of objects is a manifold, you recover Erisman's theory. So this is a useful uh, uh, generalization, which allows the statement of that theorem to hold. Uh, it turns out that there's a small technical reason why the theorem isn't true for the special case where the, the space of objects is a manifold. Okay. Um, any questions at this early stage in the talk? So um, the whole point of the theory of categories of fibrant objects is that there are certain morphisms that you'll want to formally invert. We already see this. Um, I'm getting some feedback. Does somebody have their microphone unmuted or is that me? Yeah. Um, so there are morphisms that you'd like to invert. Let me give an example. I haven't written it down. You can consider manifolds uh, as uh, presentations by a cover with charts, an atlas. And then, of course, there are, for example, diffeomorphisms between such presentations. Um, and we have to consider, we have to invert those. And so already in the theory of manifolds, hidden perhaps because we learned it so early in our, in our study of geometry, is the notion that certain maps have to be inverted. And this then became much more um, uh, 
it was somehow brought out more to the front of the subject in the theory of Lie groupoids when the notion of Morita equivalences was introduced. Um, roughly in the modern language, you could say stacks are the localization, or I should better say simplicial localization of the category of Lie groupoids with respect to Morita equivalences. Um, when I say simplicial localization, all I mean is it's some sort of refinement where now we have topological spaces of morphisms between objects. So uh, I'm not going to go into that in, in very great detail in today's talk, but um, uh, it somehow underlies the technical aspects of what I'm doing. Uh, so the advantage of categories of vibrant objects is that this localization is very concrete. It's somehow given by formulas. So you can exactly say what the end simplices in this localization are. And that gives you much greater uh, calculational control over the theory of Lie K groupoids once you have our, our theorem. So let me review a little the simplicial language that I'm going to be using. Uh, so the the idea is that um, uh, simplices are just very special small categories. And we use them uh, basically to test our categories and, and produce, in the language of Grothendieck, pre-sheaves that represent the category. Uh, for those of you who are more category-oriented, I think what one says is that the category of simplices is a generator for the um, category of categories. Um, turns out you don't need the whole category of simplices, but let's, let's, let's pretend. So the abstract n simplex, its objects correspond to the vertices of an n simplex, and there's morphisms moving uphill. So if you go from i to j, where i is less than j, then there's a morphism. But if i is greater than j, then there's no morphism. And so we can consider the, the subcategory of the category of categories whose objects are these, these small categories and the morphisms are the functors between them. So this is, this is the category of simplices, okay? So the examples, some examples to keep in mind are the one simplex, which has a initial vertex zero and a terminal vertex one. So that's the interval. And then the other one, which we'll spend a lot of time with is the two simplex, which has three uh, faces, the, the one simplices, 0, 1, 1, 2, and 0, 2. And those are the, the three non-trivial, non-isomorphisms in the category uh, bracket 2. Okay, so a, a simplicial object is a contravariant functor on delta with values in our category V um, that is a pre-sheaf. And a simplicial morphism is just a natural transformation of functors. Okay. So uh, following the usual notation of the subject, uh, the value of a simplicial object at the uh, at n is denoted x sub n. Um, so what what should I say about this? That one of the things you learn when you study simplicial sets is that not all simplicial sets are sort of suitable for doing algebra. But there's a class of simplicial sets that was isolated by uh, Dan Kahn and, and, and his um, finding this condition, which is called the Kahn condition or fibrancy, somehow gave the theory of simplicial sets the impetus that was required to lead to its current place as, as uh, one of the basic uh, languages of uh, geometry. Uh, roughly speaking, I think you can say that Kahn complexes are the non-abelian analogs of chain complexes. And uh, he was in fact impelled by Moore's theorem, which roughly speaking says that a simplicial group that is a contravariant functor from delta to the category of groups a simplicial group is a Kahn complex. So the proof is by an explicit formula. Well, later we'll re review the definition of a Kahn complex 
and, and basically the proof is just to give a formula. So the, the theory is sort of inscrutable and, um, but, but uh, remarkably powerful. And so what I'm going to do is further generalize away from the theory of sets to categories where there's some extra information like uh, the notion of a submersion, which was used by Erismann in his, uh, in his definition of Lie groupoids. So uh, let's give um, some examples of simplicial sets. So the basic example that I want you to think about is if I have a groupoid, well, as you know, you can think of a groupoid as a category, except that all the morphisms are invertible. And we'll take the nerve of a groupoid to be the simplicial set whose n simplices are just the functors from, from n to g. So it's just the representable pre-sheaf. So it's a sequence of composable morphisms, g, i, j. Well, the, the ones which are of most interest are the ones which go from i minus 1 to i, where i goes from 1 to n. So we get a sequence of n composable morphisms. When n is zero, we just have an object. And, and this simplicial set actually completely captures uh, the groupoid. In fact, even the two skeleton, the zero, one, and two simplices already completely capture the fact that we have a groupoid. And that's going to be the, the germ of the theory that I'm telling you about today. So for example, if G is a group, then, then the n simplices is just the nth power of G. And more generally, the, um, the zero simplices is the set of objects. The one simplices is the set of morphisms. And the n, plus, the n simplices is the set of compos n composable morphisms. So in particular, the set of two simplices effectively gives us the multiplication table. And that's why we can say that the 0, 1, and 2 simplices determine the groupoid. So I'm going to adopt the idea that the groupoid is the simplicial set, not that the groupoid is represented by its nerve, but that the nerve is the groupoid itself, which gives you an equivalent definition of the, the category of groupoids except that it's uh, more amenable to generalization. All right. Any questions at this point? So, um, so what I, so let's see how that, that construction goes. Um, I'm going to present the, uh, some of the uh, te technology that I'm going to need in the case of higher groupoids now. Uh, but uh, then I'll show you how to make sure that we've re reconstructed a, a groupoid from a simplicial set. So we'll start with the K simplex. So delta K, I, I forgot to write this, but delta K, um, can, um, I'm curious, if I point here, do you, uh, yeah, you see when I point, is that right? Or do you only see if I draw on delta K like that? I can see it, yeah. Yeah, so that delta K is called the K simplex. And so you see that the, the simplices, the N simplices of delta K are the weakly increasing sequences of N plus one natural numbers between zero and k. And the simplex is non-degenerate if they're strongly increasing, if they never repeat, okay? So if you think about it, that's just the geometric structure of the usual geometric k simplex. So a, a finite simplicial complex is then a simplicial set, which is a subset of delta k for some k, all right? And we're going to be interesting in the following examples. So first we have the i face of the k-simplex. So we say that a face contains the i vertex if 
the letter I is one of those um, one of those increasing uh, uh, natural numbers. And so the the I face is if you think about it's the opposite face of the I vertex. So um, here's the oh there's the the two simplex. And so the zero face is the face that goes from one to two. The second face is the face that goes from zero to one. That's the usual convention. And it's a bit surprising, but it's the one that generalizes very nicely to higher dimensions. So we have the ith face. The boundary is just the union of all the faces. And, and now we need another important um, simplicial subset of the K simplex called the ith horn. So these were introduced by Kahn. And what we do is we take all the faces except the ith face. So that's all the faces that contain the ith vertex. Okay. So the thing you'll see if you draw on a piece of paper what a horn looks like is that it, it deformation retracts to the ith vertex. So it's a um, it's what are they called a, a cone uh, and um, and it's it's contractibility which is somehow its essential um, interest. So these are the most important contractible sets that occur in the theory of simplicial sets. Okay, so for all of you who worked your way through a textbook on simplicial sets, this is now familiar material. So, so now I'm going to introduce a definition which, um, which you can find in other places, but we needed a, a snappy word for it and we maybe took the wrong word, but uh, Berend and I called these descent categories. So a descent category is a small category. So always I'm going to be talking about small categories uh, in today's uh, talk. So, for example, I need a small category of Banach spaces, a small category of manifolds, and so on. So the, the usual way we do that is by, by some sort of universe technique. So for Banach spaces, I probably am going to be restricting them to second countable Banach spaces. And then um, there's some universe which has um, a instance of each of those, and it's actually a small category. So, so we can I'm not going to emphasize this point, but, but uh, I'm able to restrict attention uh, in geometry to small categories at every stage. So I want a subcategory of my category, which are called the covers, which are going to play the role of subjective sets in the theory of sets. So I want to capture what I would consider the essence of the subcategory of subjective, set, uh, subjective functions. So it's a subcategory. If I compose two of these morphisms, I should again get such a morphism. Well, that's obviously true. The composition of any pair of uh, composable subjective functions is subjective. Also, I want all the isomorphisms to be covers. And that also is clear for subjections. And I want pullbacks of covers to be covers. And finally, and this is the essence of the definition, if um, I have a, a pair of composable covers, I'm sorry, if I have a pair of composable morphisms, and if the first of those is a cover and the composition is a cover, then the other morphism G is a cover. Okay? So the category of um, subjective functions has that property. If f is a subjective function and gf is a subjective function, then you can see that g obviously is subjective. So the category of finite sets with subjections as, a, as covers is a descent category. Now we come to a couple of slightly less well-known examples. But, um, but uh, once you, if you look at the references where these are discussed, you'll see that, that this axiom that I've isolated is duly proved uh, without, uh, in fact, signaling uh, the essential role that it's going to play. 
So the category of algebraic varieties with effective smooth morphisms as covers. So effective and smooth is just the algebraic geometers words for subjective and submersion. And, um, and so that in fact satisfies these axioms. So that's the sort of original example that I wanted to bear in mind. And then it turns out Duardi in his uh, um, uh, doctoral thesis, um, he invented the theory of analytic Banach varieties and he also, he checks that the category of subjective submersions is a, um, is a descent category in the sense that I've given. Okay, so any questions about this definition? So, um, so I'm gonna fix the descent category and most of the time it'll either be uh, analytic Banach varieties or uh, uh, algebraic varieties. And I'm going to call the objects of this category, the spaces. So um, I just realized that because I, I modified slides from another talk, I left out one of the axioms from the definition of descent categories. Um, so I'll write it in plus V has small limits. So sorry about my handwriting uh, on my tablet, but um, yeah, I left out this crucial axiom. The whole point, the problem was I was modifying slides from a talk on, on derived geometry where exactly you give up this assumption in favor of a different uh, uh, approach. But um, for us, we'll need small limits, which is why I'm working with analytic varieties and not manifolds, because the category of manifolds doesn't have pullbacks. So I'm assuming, in fact, that I have all pullbacks and a terminal object, which is a point. So for, for analytic Banach varieties, the point is, of course, a analytic Banach variety. For finite sets, it's just the set with one element. Sorry about that. So, um, so let's um, continue. So I'm going to be interested in simplicial spaces. And by simplicial space, I simply mean simplicial objects in my descent category V. So as I said, think in terms of, let's say, simplicial analytic varieties or simplicial algebraic varieties. So now I'm going to define the, I'm going to leave out the word Li when I write K groupoid uh, because uh, in some sense it plays, it, it's just, uh, it's essential or uh, I, I'm not defining K groupoids except for Li K groupoids, if you like. Um, so it's a simplicial space with the following conditions. So first of all, and now I invoke those um, horns that I mentioned earlier. Whoa, there's a, um, no, no, sorry, that's correct. So for n greater than zero and less than or equal to k, and for any vertex i, I have a horn. If you remember, it's the n simplex with the interior deleted and with the opposite face from the ith vertex deleted. And what I'm now asking is that uh, the, the space of all horns in X, that is all compatible uh, configurations of N faces, that uh, there's a map from the N simplices to that that analytic variety, let's say, or, uh, or object in V more generally. And I'm requiring that that's a cover. So um, the first example where this kicks in is where N is one. And let's take I equals zero. Then we get a map from G one. I'm sorry, um, oops. Uh, um, Raise a map from uh, x1 to x0. And that map is actually the target map of the, if I had the nerve of a groupoid, this would be the target. Um, 
And as you remember, Erisman said a, uh, he called them differentiable groupoids, but later they were renamed Lie groupoids. The condition is exactly that it's a groupoid in the category of manifolds, such that this map is a submersion. And what we're doing is generalizing that condition to uh, higher n. Um, it turns out this is the right condition. So um, I think this occurs for the first time uh, in work of Andre Enriquez in a paper in Compositio and implicitly in my work at the same time where I was integrating nilpotent L infinity algebras. Um, and the, the remaining condition is that, well, it's a similar condition for n greater than k, and the condition is that in that case, we have an isomorphism. So let's drop back to the case where k is one. So when k is one, you see that uh, we have Erismann's condition. That's the first part. And the second part is that the n simplices for n greater than two are completely determined by their horns. And it turns out that that condition for already for uh, n equals two is enough to characterize the nerves of groupoids. As far as I know, that observation is due to Grotendieck, although nobody's ever shown me the reference for where that occurs. Um, so, um, so this type of condition in the special case where of sets um, uh, occurs already in the work of Duskin. And he called them, um, well, actually in Duskin's work, it's a little tricky because he left out the first condition uh, for some reason. But let's put that first condition back in. Let's grant him that. Then this is what he called, um, uh, what did he call them? Hyper, hyper groupoids or something. And his, his point was that these hyper groupoids. You're right. They were hypergroupoids. Yeah, and where did the K go? Were they K hypergroupoids or hyper? Uh, hyper these would be, uh, well, these would be K hypergroupoids. K hypergroupoids. And his theorem was that K hypergroupoids um, modeled homotopy K types. So somehow this is a geometric generalization of Duskin's idea of homotopy K types. Uh, but, but in my view, the point is that Duskin landed on the somehow optimal uh, definition for geometers. And in particular, it, it reproduces uh, Erismann's notion of a, of a league groupoid. Uh, and so somehow I'm, I'm somehow fusing those two intuitions together to get this definition. So as I said, something like this uh, is, uh, first appears in the work of Andre Enriquez. So um, now I'm going to be able to state my, my uh, results that I announced earlier um, about categories of fibrant objects, but I have to explain to you what a category of fibrant objects is. So um, these are uh, somewhat forbidding if you aren't really keen on homotopical algebra, but I want to advertise that they're actually worth becoming comfortable with, because although the axioms look a little bit random, uh, the uh, experience of the last several decades seems to be that these, this notion is an unreasonably important notion in uh, many parts of mathematics. Um, most strikingly, it appears that it uh, plays a very natural role as a foundation of the theory of homotopy type theory. So it somehow... Uh, how do I, how could I put this? It's sort of, if you want to understand the, some of the most modern approaches to logic and, uh, and to model theory, then, oh, I shouldn't have mentioned model theory because the whole point, I guess, of homotopy type theory is to get around the ideas of model theory, but the categories of fibrant objects play the basic role in the modern understanding. So uh, they were actually introduced for um, work in algebraic K-theory to understand the algebraic K-theory of algebraic varieties. But um, 
Uh, whether or not that's why I'm using them, I'm not sure. But let's, let's forge ahead and give the definition. So again, I'm going to have a small category. And you should think in terms of the category of k-groupoids. OK? So a subcategory of that category is called a category of vibrations if V has a terminal object. Um, any morphism with target that terminal object is a vibration. And, um, and I've left out an axiom, I apologize. And pullbacks of vibrations by morphisms in V exist and are vibrations. Um, no, let me think. No, actually, it seems that I secretly... So what I, what I forgot to say is that every isomorphism is a vibration. But I think it's automatic because uh, every ob by the second axiom, every object in V... Uh, is in F. Is that right? It's implicit. So I need every, um, every isomorphism is a vibration. I apologize, my handwriting, but uh, my tablet is vertical at the moment and uh, on a stand. So uh, yeah. Okay. So um, so every isomorph, uh, yeah, uh, I shouldn't have forgotten that axiom. So, um, so that's the category of vibrations and they play an auxiliary, auxiliary role in categories of vibrant objects, but that second condition is the key one. Any morphism with target E is a vibration. So the point here is that uh, an object with that property is called vibrant and we restrict attention to, to so-called vibrant objects. The third condition um, is, the, is very important because it allows us to um, forego the hypothesis that we have all pullbacks in the category V. We, we restrict attention to just a small subclass of diagrams which uh, have pullbacks and, and we avoid in that way um, restricting attention to categories that have all, all small limits uh, because that's unreasonably restrictive. Okay, so um, the homotopy theory comes from having a subcategory of our uh, category W, which is a sub, the subcategory of weak equivalences. So in particular, all isomorphisms of, um, of our category will be weak equivalences, but the, a category of weak equivalences is a subcategory with the left and right cancellation properties. So if, um, if FG, if, uh, if a composition of two morphisms is a weak equivalence and either of the two morphisms is a weak equivalence, then the, uh, the other one is. So, so subcategories of weak equivalences, uh, it's somehow the more important part of the definition, uh, the, vibrations are going to be auxiliary and allow us to study the subcategory of weak equivalences. So um, in particular, we're interested in those um, vibrations which are also weak equivalences. And in this subject, those are called the trivial vibrations. Um, this was originally studied by, by Brown and he called them as cyclic vibrations, but uh, more recently people tend to call them trivial vibrations. So a category of vibrant objects is a, is a, a small category V with a category of vibrations and a category of weak equivalences with the following additional two axioms. The first is that the pullback of a trivial vibration is a trivial vibration. So notice I'm not assuming that the pullback of a weak equivalence is a weak equivalence. In fact, it's not even, it's not even the case that, that weak equivalences always have pullbacks. In general, they only have a pullback along a vibration. And also, every morphism can be factored into a composition of a weak equivalence followed by a vibration. Some of you will be familiar with uh, 
Quillen's theory of closed model categories. And in that theory, he has also vibrations and weak equivalences. And in, he would assume in his uh, factorization axiom that S is not only a weak equivalence, but a so-called co-fibration, which is, uh, he has an additional subcategory of co-fibrations. And somehow here, we just give that up. So we give up uh, two basic parts of Quillen's theory of model categories. One is we give up any mention of co-fibrations at all. And uh, we also give up any mention of co-limits. And secondly, uh, we give up any mention of limits except for the terminal object and pullbacks of vibrations. So, so that's roughly speaking, by stripping away an enormous amount of Quillen's work, we're left with this sort of essence of homotopical category. So um, Brown proved in his uh, original paper, and this is somehow fundamental to the subject, that the weak equivalences are precisely the sections of trivial vibrations. And, and that's uh, really important uh, to bear in mind as you follow through the subject. So you can see um, that that's a very powerful statement indeed. And it's, a, a, to me, some indication that this set of axioms is the right one, that it allows this very strong result about weak equivalences. So um, generally speaking, I would say that it's very difficult if you're just given the vibrations and trivial vibrations to work out if they determine a category of vibrant objects. Because to show that the sections of all the trivial vibrations satisfy the axioms of a category of weak equivalences becomes quite difficult. But on the other hand, um, once you've shown you have a category of vibrations, then you only have to retain the tr category of trivial vibrations and, uh, in, and, and of course the category of vibrations that determines all the structure. Okay. So, um, so the key point about categories of vibrant objects is that they have a very beautiful simplicial localization. Now, so, so uh, this is somehow not the right place to be talking about simplicial localizations, I, I fear. But I hope that people will be a little familiar with the idea of a localization of a category, which is where you formally adjoin inverses of some subcategory of morphisms. So for example, you could take the category of spaces and the category, subcategory of homotopy equivalences and formally invert the category of homotopy equivalences and you would obtain the category of um, homotopy types with, uh, well, the category of spaces with homotopy equivalences of, um, of maps between them. And in that case, the, the in isomorphisms are precisely the homotopy equivalences. So um, uh, there's a refinement of that due to um, uh, Dwyer and Kahn, in which they discovered that the same input data allow you to construct what's called a simplicial category, where the, the space, where instead of having sets of morphisms between objects, we actually get spaces of morphisms between objects. And if you apply that to this case, what you discover is that the, the space of morphisms between um, a uh, well, you need a, a small technical condition. Uh, the domain X uh, should be a, a CW complex and the target Y can be uh, any space. And then the simplicial localization of the maps between them will be, the, in fact, have the homotopy type of the space of all maps from X to Y. So that's a remarkable construction. And uh, and this also is very powerful in the theory of Lie group points, uh, where when you take the simplicial localization of the category of uh, Lie groups, or sorry, of Lie group points with respect to Morita equivalences, you get the theory of differentiable stacks. So, um, so um, what I'm kind of um, 
alluding to here is that the uh, these uh, spans that you're seeing here are, are in fact known in the theory of Lie groupoids as Hilsum scandalis morphisms. And the invertible Hilsum scandalis morphisms that are in fact the uh, Morita equivalences. Okay. So, um, oh, sorry. Uh, I seem to have left a slide out. I'm sorry. So, um, maybe I, well, I have just barely time to mention that the, already the theory of manifolds is a good example of this. So, um, if you think of a manifold, I think I mentioned, oh, sorry, I, I said this earlier, didn't I? If I think of a manifold as, a, as an atlas, then the uh, Morita equivalences, the, the, the weak equivalences are precisely the, um, the diffeomorphisms. And so the, the simplicial localization is given by inverting these. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you what the uh, category of vibrant objects of k-groupoids is. That's the main technical result of my talk. So if I have two simplicial spaces, I'm going to define a vibration. So uh, it's very similar to the definition of a Lie k-groupoid, except that uh, n is any uh, positive integer. And it's, I, it's a relative version of the definition of a k-groupoid. So I have a morphism from x to y. And roughly speaking, I'm saying that, um, so what am I saying? That, that those, if I have the space of n simplices of y together with a lift to x of, of the horn in that n simplex uh, index, uh, so I need to fix i, um, that lift, um, then I can look at the map from the space of all n simplices to that, and that should be a cover. So that's turns out that that is a category, the composition of two vibrations is a vibration, and the pullback of a vibration is a vibration. Isomorphisms are obviously vibrations. And, uh, and it turns out then finally that we have a category of vibrations. Uh, every object is vibrant, uh, sorry, every k-groupoid is vibrant, that's by the definition of a k-groupoid. So, uh, so the category of vibrations is a category of vibrations in the category of k-groupoids. Okay. The weak equivalences are called hypercovers. So the definition of hypercover now uses the boundary of the n simplex, and it's a very similar definition. The point is that um, in, the, in the theory of simplicial sets, a map which satisfies this condition is automatically a uh, 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 um, weak equivalence of simplicial sets, a weak homotopy equivalence. And in fact, the, the maps of simplicial sets that satisfy this condition are exactly the ones which are a vibration in the sense of the previous slide and uh, weak homotopy equivalences. So hypercover is somehow the essence of the notion of homotopy weak equivalence translated to the theory of Lie groupoids. And these are these are the essence also, I, I can't remember what they're called in the theory of leak groupoids because I'm not really an expert. I think it's, um, yeah, I, I don't know in fact if they have exactly a name, but a span of hypercovers is the same thing as a, a Morita equivalence. So these in fact, are, so our main result is that these are a category of weak equivalences. So that requires a bit of gymnastics. And, um, and I hope that, that people who refer to our paper will find the, the technique that we use uh, useful in other settings. Um, so, so this is somehow, this paragraph is the first non-trivial result in this talk. 
And at the rate I'm going, it'll be the last, but let's see if I can accelerate a little. And, um, and one, one of the remarkable things that we prove in our paper is that if you have a diagram of K groupoids such that their composite is a hypercover and G is a hypercover, then F is a hypercover. So I realized as I was preparing this talk, I wanted to talk about more recent generalizations of this construction, um, but uh, I, maybe I can talk about that if we have a small discussion at the end. Uh, but uh, this, is, uh, this technically was the most difficult result uh, that in proving the um, previous paragraph, that, that hypercovers form a subcategory of weak equivalences. This result, is somehow, you could say, this is known in the theory of Kahn complexes, but uh, I wasn't able to find a combinatorial proof of this result in the literature. So I forged ahead and uh, gave one myself, and it was harder than I expected. So any feedback on this um, would be much appreciated because, well, Maybe my due diligence wasn't sufficient because it largely consisted of asking Rick Jardine if he had ever seen a explicit combinatorial proof of this result, and he said no. So I considered at that point that I'd done my job, but it's possible that I didn't ask the right people. So, um, so I'll leave that out there, that question. So um, of the two, there are two difficult results in this talk, and this is the first one. So, um, uh, maybe I'll just skip that slide. Uh, basically, I've already said that uh, this reproduces the sort of classical theory of Lie groupoids. So, um, now I'm going to uh, finish uh, with by giving an example of a Lie K groupoid. Uh, so my main idea is now that if I have a Banach algebra, that its submonoid of invertible uh, elements is in fact a Lie group. And essentially that's saying that the, the subset of invertible elements is a uh, sub-manifold uh, of the Banach algebra. Well, actually, of course, it's an open subset. And and that's the theory, uh, perturbation theory. So um, everything I'm going to say now is going to be some sort of generalization of perturbation theory. I'm going to explain to you that if I have a differential graded Banach algebra, that by a certain slightly complicated construction, I can extract from it a Lie K groupoid. And somehow that's my higher generalization of perturbation theory. So whether you think that that's a fair interpretation, I'll uh, leave to you. It's possible that I'm uh, overreaching. But technically, um, it turned out to be useful to introduce a notion of a, a Lie K groupoid uh, in our work. And uh, this somehow is a new notion inspired by results in homotopy theory. So let me run over that. So the basic idea is, which goes back to Boardman and Vogt, is that you give up the lifting condition for Kahn complexes when I is zero or I is N. So we speak of the initial and terminal uh, horns, which are the ones where the vertex is the initial vertex or the final vertex. They somehow are going to play a different role in the theory. And uh, so in particular, when when uh, n is one, we have no condition at all. So we, we have temporarily lost Erismann's condition. Um, but the condition kicks back in when n is two, but in that case, uh, only with i equals one. So um, if I can draw a picture of the relevant horn, it's saying that, um, in, it's essentially saying that every um, composable pair of morphisms can be lifted to a two simplex. And now what I'm asking is that that can be done in this regular way that comes from descent categories. 
And for n greater than k, I have this isomorphism condition uh, that we have um, that similarly to the theory of k groupoids, except again, I only assume it for the inner horns, the ones where i is not equal to zero or n. So uh, as I mentioned, Boardman and Vogt introduced this condition, at least with n equal to infinity, and they called these weak Kahn complexes, and they gave many examples in the theory of operands. Um, and then Joal and Lurie extracted their definition, Boardman and Vogt's definition, and studied it in, in its own right. Uh, Joyal initiated that study and, uh, and called them quasi-categories. Lurie continued the study and renamed them again infinity categories. So at this point, they have three different names. Um, and the whole point of the subject is that the nerve of a category is a one pre-category. Okay? So the difference between um, pre-categories and categories is going to come down to the definition of what quasi-isomorphisms are in a pre-category. So, um, so this is uh, a slightly technical part of the talk, but um, remember that we had introduced the nerve delta n of this little category with um, object zero up to n. And I'm going to now introduce a replacement simplicial set for that, which is now infinite dimensional, but has the same homotopy type. Uh, it's obtained by taking the groupoid in which we invert all the morphisms in bracket n. So that's the category with n plus one isomorphic objects. So you can think of it as the category whose composable sequences of morphisms are just the paths on the n simplex. Instead of what we had earlier, which was the weakly monotonically increasing paths. All right. So in particular, you might want to think about the, the case of the uh, n equals one. So in that case, we're getting some fattening of the one simplex. And Joyal called it j. Uh, he called the ordinary interval, the one simplex i. So he thought in terms of i contained in j, which is the one simplex contained in what we're calling blackboard bold delta one. And if you think about it, the non-degenerate simplices are just um, sequences 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, et cetera, or 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. So you have two non-degenerate simplices in J in each dimension. And so J is in fact the, the classifying space for the, sorry, it's the classifying um, bundle for the, um, uh, for the cyclic group of, of two elements. So you can think of it as the double cover of RP infinity. It's the infinity sphere. And these two cells are the upper and lower hemisphere in each dimension. And, and roughly speaking, a one morphism in a category is a, um, a functor, it's a, it's a functor from on delta n, and a uh, quasi-isomorphism is a functor on bracket delta n. So in other words, a simplicial map from delta, bracket delta n into our category. So from J for n equals one into our category. Okay. So these are in fact quite large, but they're quite large simplicial sets, but they're finite if in each dimension, uh, but they're infinite dimensional, which is a, a technical difficulty. So as I said, J or blackboard bold delta one is the infinity globe and by definition, the quasi-invertible morphisms of X are the simplicial maps from uh, blackboard bold delta one to X. So here we have, I've now given you the ultimate expression of Erismann's original condition that the map from the, um, the, the target map from morphisms to objects is a cover. In the theory of um, 
Lee K groupoids and Lee K categories, it becomes that the, the map from the space of quasi isomorphisms to um, the objects given by target is a cover. Okay, I could also use the source map, but uh, just like in Erisman's definition, uh, they're, you, they're equivalent. Okay, so um, I'm going to have to, I think I'll skip this part, but there's a theory of uh, you can construct a, a um, category of fibrant objects. Uh, it has the same trivial vibrations as the uh, category of k-groupoids, except that the object, we have more general objects. They're the k categories. So you have to have considerably more vibrations, um, but somehow the definition of weak equivalence is very similar to the old one because, because the trivial vibrations are given by the same definition as before. So I'll, I'll, since we're, I'm going to be disseminating the slides, uh, I'll just pass over this. And so now our next main result is that we give an exact functor between these two categories of fibrant objects. So one of these categories is the category of Lie K categories for fixed K, and the other is the category of Lie K groupoids. And somehow in the, in the special case of categories and groupoids, it would be the, the groupoid of invertible uh, morphisms. But if you look at the definition of uh, quasi-isomorphism, you'll notice that it's not morphisms with a condition, but morphisms with additional data. I give you a candidate uh, quasi-inverse, I give you candidate homotopies on the left and right, and in fact, a tower of higher um, hemispheres in each dimension. And so, um, so it turns out that by going to that viewpoint of thinking of a quasi-isomorphism not as a special kind of morphism, but a morphism with additional data, that, that it makes it more straightforward to formulate and prove results like this one. So, so it's this basic idea that the, that, the, uh, that the operation of going from a K category to its subcategory of quasi-invertible morphisms um, is an exact functor. Uh, it preserves vibrations and preserves weak equivalences. Um, then we have another result, which is very close to the result I told you about in perturbation theory. This is somehow our generalization of perturbation theory that the, the natural map from this um, replacement for the invertible or quasi-invertible morphisms in a K category to the original K category, its image is a K groupoid. And the map from the from blackboard ball G of X to the, its image is a hypercover. That's that's one of our main results. So that sort of perturbation theory erected to the, the three of Lee K groupoids. Now in the, the zero minutes um, remaining to me, I'll tell you my example. So, um, so the, the background to this example, so I should check with Dai. Can I, have, can I have a couple more minutes? Yeah, sure, please carry on. Say no, in which case I'll just stop. But uh, <laughs> let me for, I knew that you couldn't say no, could you? Yeah. Uh, so, since I'd already, in some sense, taken them. So, um, so Kapranov has the following idea. We can take the normalized cochains on the n simplex with values in the n, uh, n by n matrices. Or in other words, I can take n by n matrices of the, the algebra of normalized cochains on the n simplex. This algebra on delta n, this is, if you think about it, it's a finite rank um, algebra, uh, differential graded algebra. It goes from dimension zero up to dimension n. In dimension zero, it's um, n plus one dimensional. 
in dimension n, it's one dimensional, and in between, it's given by binomial coefficients. So it's some very concrete uh, differential graded algebra, and we take n by n matrices in that. So, um, so uh, Kapranov's idea, oops, now I have a, a mistake. Uh, Kapranov's idea, this is because I, I was, um, yeah, uh, reusing slides. Kapranov's idea is to take the more carton locus in that. I'll send you, Di, the corrected uh, slides. So he takes the, the, the analytic variety of Morikata elements in this differential graded algebra. And in that way, we obtain a simplicial affine variety. And, and then this is not, this is, okay, so the basic, the basic result is that this is a, um, So what is, what is my basic result? That this is a one category, if you like, a, a Lee one category. I've got to rewrite these slides, so don't look at them too carefully. I just, I, I copied them uh, without thinking at the last minute. Okay, so, so my, let me go back over the basic construction, okay. So, um, so what I'm doing is now I'm taking the simplicial cochains on this delta n blackboard bold delta n with values in the n simplex and taking its more carton locus, and that's the basic example in our in our theory. So what we proved in our paper was that that's actually the the group GLn, and and then what we were, are able to prove is that this construction works for any differential graded Banach algebra. We take the more carton locus of the cochains on this blackboard bold delta N with values in A and assuming, oh, everything's wrong. Assuming that I vanishes, A I vanishes for I less than or equal to minus K, then this is a Banach Lee K groupoid. So that's our last, our last main result. And it's proved using the, by first showing that if you have the n simplex instead of this, um, this enhanced n simplex that you get a uh, k category and then applying this result uh, on um, the exact functor. So sorry that that last bit was a little bit disjointed, um, but I can go over it a bit more slowly if anybody wants to linger. So thank you, and um, yeah. So th thank you very much, Ezra. <laughs> so uh, any 